take us through to afternoon tea, Catherine Rich and Mike Chapman on creating value. Now, Catherine Rich, as the Food and Grocery Council Chief Executive, she's been busy lately, and Mike Chapman, I know from my association with this conference over the years that he is always busy, and I know this because that's what he's always told me. Ladies and gentlemen, creating value, Catherine Rich and Mike Chapman. Better listen to Lance. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very fortunate to be joined this afternoon by Catherine Rich who has been uh, my long-term collaborator when it comes to exactly this topic. What we can do to create value. We probably should sit a little bit closer <laughs> together. Uh, so it is something that's really important and something that really affects everyone in this room. What we have seen, particularly with domestic supply, is margin stagnation. And so what we have been collectively trying to do is work out how we can change that dynamic and what really is happening in the New Zealand market. What we'll do in our presentation today uh, should now be on the screen, and we'll give you a bit of an overview of what the Commerce Commission uh, released last week, but that isn't really what our presentation is about. The Commerce Commission is a fact-finding fact process which will go through to a final report later this year going to government. And you know, the Minister did talk a little bit about this and what the government's commitments might be. But the real thing from the Commerce Commission report is what we actually do with it and how we understand what is happening in our market. And so we'll try and give a little bit of that understanding as we go forward. But first, uh, fruit to the uh, Commerce Commission report. So you'll note um, that we've used speech marks all of these points on the slide are the Commons Commission's points and not particularly mine or Catherine's. Uh, the interesting thing is we spend 22 billion a year on our groceries. 22 billion. That is just a staggering figure. And how much of that actually gets back to you as way of margin is an open question. Uh, the average spend per household is $234 a week. But when you look at what the Commerce Commission found about the supermarket chains, they found that their return on capital was around 21 to 23%. What the Commission says is that a weighted average return should be between 4 and 6%. So those of you in your own businesses will know exactly, or you should know exactly, what your return on capital is. And surely, if you got a return on capital over 20%, that would be pretty damn good. We are the sixth most expensive grocery market in the OECD. And we're the sixth highest spender per capita on groceries in the OECD. So we are really into it in a big way. And the last fact that relates to the points on this slide is that what we get from the two supermarket chains is about 80 to 90% of what we purchase. So it, it is a real situation where there are only two operations where we buy our groceries from. And that's exactly uh, what this slide says. Foodstuffs in Woolworths New Zealand are the people we shop at and are the people who feed us what we want to eat. And the Commerce Commission went through, and it's a very long report, and if you want to read it, it's on their website. And they've got a lot of analysis, uh, but what we're going to focus on is the suppliers to the supermarket. And, you know, the Commission did look at how they could change the settings around what they consider the duopoly to be. But, uh, in my view, those settings actually ignore the reality of the situation which we're in in New Zealand. And what we really need to do is work with what we've got to achieve what we need. But I'll hand over at this point to Catherine. Thank you, thank you, Mike. And first of all, I do want to thank Mike and Port New Zealand for um, being a sounding board and being able to work on these issues together. The Food and Grocery Council is very small, um, but the issues that we're talking about today are not just ones that have happened in the last you know, couple of years. Um, 
that have been happening over the last few decades. So, um, as Mike said, the, the Commission's report was very thorough, it was very accurate, and from a supplier perspective, I think it told a, a story, um, a story that most of us already knew, but it was just uh, different to have such um, a thorough piece of work, data, etc. So, um, in terms of the detailed um, Commission's findings on suppliers, they, they told the very strong story about what had changed over the last 20 years. And for suppliers, I suppose one of the main things is, and, and, and the essence of this slide, is uh, in terms of costs, risk, power, um, there have been shifts either one way or the other. In terms of risk, a lot of the risk associated with the provision of groceries and um, particularly fresh produce back onto the supplier, a lot of costs back onto the supplier, and of course a, a lot of the margin the other way. Um, you know, I think what has happened with the Commission's report, it gives us a marvellous opportunity to speak about what we would like for our industry for the next 20 years. And I think we can do that in a really positive way and do it with our retail partners. Um, but also I think it is time for some tough, tough discussions, really, uh, as we try and preserve our wonderful food industry into the future. Um, the second thing I suppose I'd say is that why this is so important to get right is that over a period of time, particularly in the last two decades, we've seen a lot of people get out of our industry. And it was interesting when, I, when Mike and I spoke at the, the strawberry growers, you know, to hear about growers getting out of the industry. It's the same in FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. You know, small, micro, medium companies saying, look, we just can't make this work. And if you lose that fabric in the food industry, uh, we lose that local production, we lose those jobs for our young people, and there's ultimately an impact on the economy. So I suppose in terms of the draft findings, it was very, very accurate in terms... I'll get you to click that yes, mic on. Certainly. I'm hopeless with technology. <laughs> um, but secondly, why a code? Well, the code was first raised um, many years ago, and you may, may or may not know this, but it was actually as a result of concerns from growers that the first idea of a code was mooted. Sue Kedgley, back, way back um, in around about 2005, did a survey and she started talking about it. In 2009, the UK brought in a code. They were worried because they only had 10 supermarkets to serve in the UK, so they thought that market concentration was so bad that they had to have a code. Um, the Aussies followed in 2015. They had uh, three or four, and they thought the concentration was high. Here in New Zealand, it's over 90% um, between the, the, within the duopoly. And so finally, we're having this discussion. I was quite heartened to hear what uh, Minister O'Connor said. So one of the things about a code is it's not just um, about changing laws, it's about changing some behaviours. And I can assure you, if you have good relationships with the retailers now, those relationships will may, remain positive and, and great. And I you know, pay tribute to retailers like Grant Robinson and others who go out and you know, get in amongst it. Um, but what a code can do is change the behaviour of some of the things that have occurred that I've um, heard from our members um, for a very, very long time. It's an opportunity to lift, lift everybody's game and focus on having a few more rules. Finally, um, I think, uh, and I've got a few slide, uh, slides coming up, it just changes and codifies a few of the processes so it becomes more transparent about what you're supposed to do and what's supposed to happen back. That uh, wasn't final, but finally, um, it needs to be mandatory. In Australia, it was voluntary, and the UK, it was voluntary initially didn't work. They, in the UK they spent about 10 years on vol various voluntary guidelines before they finally said, look, this has to be enshrined in law. So New Zealand can learn from that, and that's why we've been calling for a mandatory code uh, for New Zealand. So what should be covered by a code? And I know this is a really busy slide, and I'm not going to read them all out. But I just wanted to paint the picture of some of the things, some of the behaviours that uh, the suppliers, uh, the producers, the growers in the room may or may not have faced um, during your time in 
in your work. Um, and things like um, some of the behaviours, some, uh, I suppose I'd focus on things like coercive behaviour, things that could be described as uh, bullying, additional costs that there don't seem to be any rhyme or reason for. Um, you know, the Australians have a terrible term called cliffing. When I first joined the Food and Grocery Council, I said, what is this cliffing? And uh, the Australian retailer said to me, it's, it's when we take suppliers to the edge of the cliff and ask them to look over, i.e., if you don't do this, we're going to delete you off the shelf. Um, I haven't heard of um, cliffing here, but it's the sort of behaviours that we want to rule out in the code. Things like payments for shelf space, um, extreme payments for waste, payments for promotions that you don't want, necessarily want to participate in, payments for, um, I don't know, everything. I've seen, seen and heard so many additional payments over the last 13 years. A more recent one, and I'm not sure if growers have um, had this conversation, but you know we've had some uh, New World and Pack and Save stores recently start to ask suppliers for investments in the wage account of the stores to pay for the staff on the stores. You know, to go back to the main theme of what a, well, of the last 20 years, it's that shift of cost backwards to suppliers, shift to risk backwards, and the margin going the other way. So one of the other um, things I will pull out there from the slide is intellectual property protections. And you might think, well, why is that important? I have seen examples of growers doing the hard yards to develop new, in, new and interesting products to put on the shelf, and the retailer saying, hey, I really like that new fancy tomato, I want it for my private label, when in fact the supplier wants to make sure that it's a branded product so they can capture that connection with consumers. The final thing on this slide I'm going to pick out is the issue of fair payments, and payments within certain time periods that are realistic and reasonable. And I always remember talking to an egg producer, and he said, I deliver my eggs on day one, they're actually sold that day, because I deliver every day, and I'm paid you know, six to nine weeks later. Well, why is that when it's a fresh, uh, you know, fresh product, it's got high t um, turnover, um, the supermarkets had its money, and they have to wait so long? You know, that neg negative cash flow uh, that's enjoyed by some of the stores, I think it's time to have some serious conversations about fair payments that are reasonable to, to improve the cash flow of suppliers. Um, there are lots of other things I could have put up there, but the main thing with the, with the, uh, with the code content is that we need to work together um, with all of you to determine what, a, what the code in New Zealand might look like, because we don't want to just cover fast-moving consumer goods, packaged goods, but ensure that every supplier's needs are covered. So here's what the Commission said in terms of what they were thinking in terms of um, a code of conduct. The main was to make sure that all contracts are in writing and that they're in clear language, that they're not co coercive in any way, that they're fair contracts, that they have um, very clear delivery requirements and what happens when groceries are rejected. So you can't just say, I don't like that carrot, so I'm not paying for all of them. You know, um, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't happen in your industry, but it's happened in some other packaged goods area areas that um, I've heard of. But the big thing is no, no retrospective variations to contracts or arrangements. So, um, you know, in Australia, there have been some terrible examples of the retailers uh, going back, doing forensic audits that can sometimes go back up back seven years, seven, five years, sometimes three or four, and then turning up to the supplier and saying, we've determined that you've had all these extra benefits or we haven't charged you enough, um, please write out a cheque. And so there are lots and lots of things that the um, Commission could uh, consider. The Commission's just put some pretty broad principles, but it's up to us, up to suppliers, and with the next cost submission process to furnish them with additional ideas that are both prescriptive but also embody the spirit of the intent. The, um, the main essence of a code of conduct is to deal in good faith, to put a value on relationships, to do what you're going to say to do, you're going to do and 
pay well, have that exchange, by golly, have that robust negotiations. No one's pretending for one moment that uh, you're going to shortcut that and the really important exchange and the hard bargaining. But I think a code does bring in um, just a, uh, you know, quite a few more rules to make sure that growers, producers, manufacturers have a few more rules, a bit of paper to wave around to say um, uh, when they're in that process. So one of the things that came out of the Commission report that we were quite surprised about was what you can see on this slide here. And so, you know, everyone's got a general idea of what competition law is about, and competition law, I guess, is at the heart about having strong competition so that, you know, prices are set uh, fairly and, and you get uh, what, what is fair and equitable. And what our submission, which was put together with Vegetables New Zealand and uh, all our collaborators, talked a lot about was transparency being really important. But uh, what, what the Commission did re uh, recommend or uh, put forward in its draft report is this idea of collective bargaining. And you can see on the slide there, and once again we've used speech marks for what uh, the Commission said, they considered that this could be possibly a way in which to deal with the situation in New Zealand. Not in addition to a code uh, in their report, but as a separate thing. And the interesting fact there, as you can see in the bottom half of the slide, was that the equivalent of the Commerce Commission in Australia, the ACCC, has already done this. Uh, but note the last bullet point on the slide and think about your business, uh, the collective annual turnover of less than 10 million, and that's all the people in the collective bargaining structure. That, that's uh, a very low figure. But you know, that is a concept which can perhaps be run forward. What we've got to do with the Commerce Commission's report is uh, by the end of this month, August, we've got to put in another submission. And in doing that next submission, we're interested in everything you've got to say so that we can uh, incorporate that in the submission that goes forward before they do their final report. But this idea of having a special exemption for suppliers to collectively bargain with supermarkets or distributors is a very interesting concept and one which I think we should explore just a little bit more. It was a suggestion that sort of caught us by surprise, wasn't it? It, it certainly was. For an industry association to suddenly think, hey, am I going to be, um, like, is it going to be like running a union? Am I going to blow my whistle and say, everybody out? Um, you know, initially we thought it was a very interesting thing, but we're giving it a proper, proper consideration. Yeah, and you can see on the next slide we've put up that uh, that just takes the, some of the thinking from the Commons Commission a step further. But you know, they, they do say at the bottom, uh, collective bargaining may not be sufficient on its own. But you know, what we're now going to do is, is really um, turn a little bit away from what the Commission said in its report and talk a little bit about the real analysis of what could happen in New Zealand for the benefit of both retailers, distributors, and suppliers. And you know, there is this one fact which you just can't get by. And although the Commission spent pages and pages and pages of recommendations and analysis to try and get past it, New Zealand is a small country. It's a long country. And you know, the, the concept of having more than perhaps two strong retailers selling groceries it may not be practical at all. It may be that this is what we've got. So, you know, if we say this is what we've got, how can we make it work is what I'm thinking about and what we're thinking may be what we should be submitting to the Commission. The Commission talked about breaking up uh, distribution in the retailers' operations from the retail shopping. That, that would not work in our view because you'd be taking away the ability to actually service the market as efficiently as they do. Uh, the Commission talked about some other things that they might try and do, help another new entrant come in and compete. Uh, but, but it ignores the fact that this country is small and it's very long. And so what can we do to actually change the dynamic so that we have a better operating system, so that margin can flow back towards suppliers 
from where it's now accumulated, as Catherine said, with the uh, retailers. So um, how are we really going to make that happen, do you think, Catherine? I strongly think that there is, there is no, there's not going to be one single a action that improves the current market, but we have to view this as a suite of changes that together will move the dial. And, and I say that because there's, there's a part of uh, our industry that's n never going to be um, a walk in the park. There's always going to be that robust negotiation, and so there should be. You know, they're, 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 we're all talking about a business, but it's about introducing some fairness and transparency. So there are a couple of things that the government's already done. They've changed the Commerce Act um, to introduce the op opportunity for the market study. They're changing Section 36, to, which is the abuse of market power, to strengthen it, to strengthen that prohibition. And David Clark, the Minister, has also got, uh, it's nearly in its third reading, a change to the Fair Trading Act, which will introduce pro prohibitions on unconscionable conduct. Um, and, um, I was once described to me that uh, unconscionable conduct is very hard to, um, to explain to people, but it's a bit like a hippopotamus, um, hard to explain, but you certainly know it when you see it. And um, it's the same with something that happens in day-to-day -day business dealings where you think, that, that's not right. We've moved in from something that's just day-to-day -day business into bullying, coercion, etc. So there are a few things that could change quite apart from a code. There are a few practices uh, within our industry, and I'm not sure it's the same for your, yourselves, but things like one retailer putting pressure on a supplier not to supply another retailer, or if a supplier is expanding out to supply another newcomer, for example, the Honest Grocer, or it could be Soupy, or it could be the Warehouse as they roll out their increased grocery provision. Retailers saying, hmm, that's really interesting, and applying pressure, that sort of behaviour to be ruled out. And that's the kind of stuff that can be in a code. Um, as I said, if you've got good re relationships with retail, that will continue, because we all know we're working people, people uh, versus, versus people. But in terms of some of the behaviours that we've all heard about and some of you will have experienced, the code is about just tidying things up and providing a few more rules and greater transparency. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. And I think it's our chance as an industry to stand together. I mean, I hope every single group under Hort New Zealand has a look at it and says, yep, we're, we're in. Because it's got to have all of your horticultural flourishes. The, the codes that have been written around the world have been really from a packaged goods viewpoint, not from you know, the, the, the nuances and um, you know, the different parts of you know, your part of the industry. Well, and that's our real challenge going forward, isn't it? How we can make it actually work for fresh, um, as opposed to if you do look at the codes around the world, they are quite honestly not looking at fresh. So we need to think about the, the factors that relate to fresh. But the other thing that I think is quite unfortunate with the Commerce Commission report, and particularly how the media has interpreted it is that they're, they're making villains out of the retailers. And you know, this isn't about having villains and good guys. This is about how we can move forward to actually create a system which is fair and shares margin fairly. It's not about vilifying. It's not about saying that's bad. It's about how we move to a really sensible and integrated position for the future. You know, the fact that um, Countdown's one of the sponsors of this conference is really important in that they're putting themselves here in the audience and with, um, with us to try and work to something new. So I think it's about partnership, it is about transparency, but we can't forget the last point on that slide. From the government, it was never really about supply, it was about consumers. And what the government was worried about was consumers are paying too much. Well, um, a lot of us in this room might think that consumers aren't paying enough and that they should be paying more into the future. And so the thing that I really take out of what we can do of the Commerce Commission report is develop a new partnership, retail, distributor, supplier, to go into the future with transparency so that we can actually work with our consumers so they understand why things cost what they do.
I mean, I think it's marvellous that Countdown is the main sponsor here, and you can just tell the work that they do, the genuine work to reach out and to build those relationships. Do you know, in my 13 years, I can't recall any complaint that I've ever had about um, any, any bullying in a Countdown store, which people might be surprised, but um, I think because all the stores are linked and national, um, actually, I think probably, and there are many here who could confirm or deny, I don't know, I actually think Countdown's living under the culture and banner of the Australian code in New Zealand anyway. Um, now I think we do have, have a uh, significant opportunity here to have those conversations. It's not about apportioning blame, it's saying can we do better business to make sure that our local industry flourishes and that, that we can manufacture and derive normal profits. I was really shocked when I attended the strawberry conference uh, to hear that one particular grower had not had, he, well, essentially he was being paid the same for his punnet of strawberries as he had been 45 years ago. One of the things the code in Australia does is put in pr place really clear processes about how to ap approach price increases so that um, suppliers have a fair opportunity to raise those issues when you've got genuine price increases across the supply chain. And by golly, haven't we got increased price problem, cost problems at the moment. And you know, this, this uh, slide, which is our second to last, is about taking a wider view. And, and you know, one of the things that Hort NZ has been consistently talking to government about is food security and having some policy in New Zealand that works out, can we feed this country and the Pacific before we look further afield? Have we actually got any planning in place about where we are going in the future. Are we going to nurture the fact that we need to grow our own vegetables, fruit and berries? Now, these things are not on the table and are things which I believe uh, the government needs to be intricately involved in, in planning for the future. So it's not about hitting up uh, re supermarkets, it's about taking a holistic view across the entire supply chain, but across what New Zealand must do to be a survivor in this new post-COVID world when we get to that point? Well, I think we've um, got to get used to talking about food security. I mean, there have been times I, I, I think it's been raised in Wellington and it's almost tant tantamount to um, admitting that one's a communist. Um, it's not at all. You know, we, COVID taught us that we have to really think about what we grow here, what we can, what we can do for our own citizens um, in terms of providing good food and make sure that we have capacity on shore. Now, certainly on the other supply, um, other part of the food industry, the importers, I mean, we're having, a, having an incredibly difficult t time with logistics and supply chain. I mean, I'm really, years ago when I was asked by the media about anything to do with food supply, I'd say, you know, robust and resilient food supply network. Now, I'm getting quite worried because the impacts of ports of Auckland problems in the Northern Hemisphere with containers and logistics, some transport costs rising by a thousand percent in a year, that is start, we're starting to see that downstream effect in out of stocks and you know, food, it's a time to have that discussion about food and grocery security for our country because uh, we, we've lost a lot of local manufacturing in the last 30 years. And, and, and this isn't just about that manufacturing, it is also that second main bullet point on the slide there is about the ability to actually grow in this country, to fit in with the you know, myriad of regulations and, and prescription that we're getting from the government. There needs to be a balance, there needs to be an understanding that you know, you've got to look at the, how you grow your food holistically and in a real sense about how you can look after your country how you can have that food security going into the future. So, you know, this is a lesson that COVID is teaching us uh, that the crime will be if we don't listen to that lesson. On that point, um, I mean, I thought the advocacy that Hort New Zealand did on the elite soils in Pukekohe, I mean, that was fan a fantastic piece of work, and the Food and Grocery Council um, backed you with that. But, you know, the worry has to be, you know, houses and... Uh, um, Really, uh, really important resource. But once the house is on 
the land, you can't grow anything else. And I say that as a girl from the Tyree Plains where when I grew up there were lots and lots of market gardens. Um, I don't, I think there are, there might be one left now. And again, you've got that lost food supply for the local population. And, you know, we, we don't want to import everything. So, you know, uh, this is our last slide and it's about transcending beyond what we're actually talking about here at this point in time. It's about making sure those points of differences on the slide can be used not only for domestic but export supply, about how we can change the whole dynamic with the consumers that purchase our product so they understand why they're paying what they're paying but that we have the whole integrated supply chain from grower, distributor, fruit, retailer, exporter, in sync and working collaborative one with really good transparency. You know, this is our opportunity as a horticulture industry to actually make those changes in collaboration with people such as Catherine's organisation to make a real difference for the future. As Catherine said, this is, you know, the Commerce Commission report has given us a chance to have a reset. And to be fair, you know, when the terms of reference were given to the Commerce Commission by the government, they weren't talking about the supply angle. And it was one thing that we had to go and argue with the Commission saying, you must look at supply if you're going to look at retail. You've got to take a holistic view. And I don't think the Commission's done that yet. They haven't taken that holistic view. They're stuck in their little silo thinking about just pricing and just the duopoly. It's much bigger than that in, in our submission. And that's how we've got to take it forward. It is about the future. It's not about narrow duopoly definitions. One of the, one of the um, within the Food and Grocery Council, we have a bit of an overlap in terms of members. We've got TNG and Seeker and Meadow Mushrooms and McCain and Watties and uh, a few others. But some of the times when I'm sitting and having my coffees with Mike and talking about the issue of obesity in this country, I say to him, look, we'd be, we'd be, a, we'd be, we'd be, um, a lot better off if so New, New Zealanders uh, just ate a lot more of your products um, and made sure they did have that five plus um, a day because so often the debates about food, about what we shouldn't do and shouldn't be eating, as opposed to reminding everybody about that healthy food um, uh, requirement and just the basics of good nutrition. So it was really great to hear Jerry speak about that before. But the people in this room are standing, and for many people, standing between um, good health and bad health for a lot of Kiwis. So I take my hat off to you in terms of your promotion and the work you do to create that healthy stuff. And after Lance's session, we'll finish our coffee with some deep breathing. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we've allowed a little bit of time uh, if there are any questions. Um, I'm sort of used to the roving mic, uh, but we don't have a roving mic. I think you've got to put it in on your app. Uh, and I'm not sure actually how we get the questions up here. Um, but if, if uh, I, can, uh, I can ask Catherine some questions quite easily. <laughs> so um, uh, while we're getting that sorted out. So Catherine, how are you going to go about putting together your next submission for the Commerce Commission? What I, when we started this process a year ago, I realised that an, um, many suppliers were fearful about putting in a submission yep. and even fearful about even providing the Food and Grocery Council with information for a submission because they didn't want to be in a situation where a retailer could say, have you had anything to do with this? And um, so what I did was I decided to construct a team so I got the very best I could find in competition law, very best in terms of economics, so we got Matthews Law, Castalia, and a, a firm called Hexus Quadrant that provided us with insight and sales and retail um, expertise. Because I'm, um, although I worked in the primary sector a, as a marketer, I don't, you know, I'm not the expert on all that on, on the retailing and the sales part. So I left it to them to draft, and because I wanted our submission to be above the reproach in terms of accuracy. Um, wanted it to be fact-based and objective. And you know, I can tend to get a bit colourful sometimes with my language. I didn't want it to be something that sounded like it had come from a former politician. I wanted it to sound far more dignified than that. Um, so we're approaching our next submission by um, 
picking up on the points of the Commission. Um, we also, in, in following on from about 100 gigabytes worth of evidence that we gave to the Commission during the first part of the process, we're going to be adding a bit more. We're going to be providing a matrix of the behaviours that we would like to um, ensure are captured by a code. But we're inviting everybody to get involved. Um, I think we've got some good numbers now. Really does need people to have the courage to participate and speak out. And I've been just amazed. Um, there was a small granola maker, and it's the first supplier in about 13 years, who I've seen come out and talk about her experience in a very objective way. It was on Newsroom. And um, you know, I took my hat off to her, but most suppliers are still feeling a very genuine fear about speaking out and having their say. So um, I really have felt very well supported along the way um, in terms of having a sounding board, but I think it is an opportunity for every group underneath Hort New Zealand to have a look at it and say, you know, we're, we're in, we want, we want a code, and here are the things we'd like to have in it. And, and you know, the Hort's mission, if I get my way, will be talking about the wider holistic approach that we need and how there aren't villains and how we all need to integrate to work together. But we now have a roving mic, uh, so if anyone's got a question, uh, put your hand up and Andrew will give you the mic. You're right about there not being any villains. I mean, we've got a marvellous yeah. industry with we have. great people in it. Catherine, um, I started business in 1966 as a grower, and uh, I've seen the rights of growers <laughs> trampled in the mud. And I, when I was in fresh sector and beach fed, we used to try to bring a code of conduct in when um, England and Australia were looking at it, and it was rejected. So I've waited 50 years for this day to see um, something like this come up. And I think every grower in this room should be making a submission to the Commerce Commission. Doesn't matter if it's good, bad, or whatever. But just tell them your experiences of what you measure you have come under. I, I mean, and I commend you for your work you've done in the Food, food Grocery Council. And I think we should all join you, get behind you, because this is what we need. This, this is going to be our one and only chance that we can bring a code of conduct in. And um, this is what we were working for all that, all that time. And I, I do blame the uh, Commerce Commission for putting us in such, growers in such a weak position. I, I mean, if you take um, higher crates, in the old days, in the um, 60s to 90s, the Chinese growers used to look after all higher crates issues, and we kept the cost of higher crates right down, and we used to share share the cost of higher crates with retailers, if any, if any of you are old enough to remember that. And even like um, potato bags, carrot bags, cartons, we, we could get half our cost back from the retailer. Because in, in the end, like in all the banana boxes, they used to sell them back to the growers anyway. And then um, the Commerce Commission said we had a collective agreement with the retailers and they wouldn't let us do that. Yep. So then we had a, um, made it a conditional sale through all the merchants and we put the value down can, and we got it back. Can but I... Then, um Thank you for those very kind words, but can I pay tribute to people like you who have been advocates for many, many decades? Sometimes ideas take so long to, to um, go through the various processes. It was interesting for the Food and Grocery Council, only five years ago we did a survey about whether people wanted a code and only 60% said yes. 
Um, the last time we did that survey, 95% um, yes, said yes. So um, I really take my hat off to the growers because I, th I'm, I strongly believe that it's your advocacy that's kicked the whole discussion along to this point now where we're close. And I remember speaking to one government official, quite high ranking at a function just um, about a year ago, and I was not mentioning anything, but he called me over and he said, how's it all going with the code? And he said, no, you've all got one shot at this, make it count. Yeah. And I think working together, we can make this count. We are on the cusp of really moving the dial in a positive way. So to all the growers here, this is our one and only opportunity of changing something, something for the better. I've seen rights of growers just trampled in the mud. And I've got up and actually said that. And I have been penalised for it as well. My company was actually blacklisted by one of the supermarkets for five years. And we didn't, I, we didn't find that out until a, um, a merchant told us. So, Catherine, I commend you and keep up the good work. Thank you. Any other questions out there, uh, Andrew? Nice. Yeah, hi, Catherine. Um, I've got a concern for all the growers. Um, why don't we make it a mandatory that all, all growers supply the markets only and not the supermarkets? Because, because they're squeezing out the profit margin. And that way at the market, everyone pays a fair price mm. with the other retailers. That's my take on the subject. And, and ironically, that's one of the uh, options the uh, Commission didn't suggest uh, in its report. But mm. thank you for that, yes. Andrew, any other questions? Comments? It's incredibly hard to see from up here. <laughs> no? Well, um, we're, we're right on time now, but um, we're putting together the submission. Catherine and I will work in collaboration on it. Over there, oh, there's George. <laughs> only, only one short comment, George. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was the reason we didn't have roving mics because I, I hang on to it long. But I'm George Tony Mangueco Asparagus, as some of you might know. But one of the questions, my question is, why can't we do like the EU and Great Britain? Why can't the consumer be subsidised for a cheaper product? They, the, the farmers through Europe and Great Britain have been subsidised for years to produce cheaper food for the consumers. Is there any chance that that can happen here? Well, it's, mm. again, it's not a topic that was touched upon in the Commerce Commission because, of course, the elephant in the room in the discussion of food prices is, is GST. And around the world, um, many places in the EU and the UK and even Australia, the basic healthier foods aren't taxed at all. But um, that would be a, a matter for uh, Port New Zealand to champion, I, I'm, I'm not sure the Food and Grocery Council would have much success raising that. Yes, they, uh, thank you for that comment, George. So um, I think that probably brings us to the end, but we will be developing the submission, and we only have a couple of weeks in which to do that. So if you have any comments, and we've taken note of what's been said today, but if you have any comments, please email me, talk to me, go to Catherine. We want to hear them. We want to create a really good submission going forward as a basis um, for actually taking this opportunity to make some real differences. So thank you all, and thank you, Catherine. <laughs>